Great, we'll get started. So today we are going to talk about how to design controllers using optimization-based methods. Uh, there are two optimization-based methods that we talked about. One is called the robust control design as well as the, the usual optimization-based method. So, so we'll talk a little bit about both of them. Uh, the thing is, uh, I need, in order to introduce the optimization-based controller design method, I need to talk about optimization first. So that's what we are going to do. Of course, we are. Uh, this this topic is covered in great detail in EC fifty five hundred, which is also concurrently running in this semester, uh, but. Uh, I know many of you are probably not taking, I, I don't think anyone is taking the 5500 class. So you will learn a lot more about optimization there, but uh, this class we are just going to cover some of the essential stuff that is needed for controller design. So there are two topics that I want to cover today. Uh, well, there is static optimization and dynamic optimization. So in the static optimization, the problem is I want to minimize C of u. u is an Rn. So that's one kind of static optimization. Another kind of static optimization is I want to minimize C of u. u is an Rn. And then G of u less than or equal to 0 h of u is equal to 0. This is known as an unconstrained problem. This is known as a constrained optimization problem. And then the dynamic one is what is we are more interested in. But in order to study the dynamic optimization, we first need to study the static optimization which is precisely what we are going to be talking about today. And then we'll move on to dynamic optimization perhaps later today or early next class where we'll talk about the So this is the topic that we are going to talk about in the subsequent classes. If you recall, in the dynamic optimization uh, uh, that I introduced in the previous class, there was a noise term here and there was an expectation. So I'm going to talk about deterministic dynamic optimization first, and we'll move on to stochastic dynamic optimization after we have completed the course on, I mean, the review of probability and statistics. OK? So for those of you who came in a little uh, later, uh, this is the topic of today's class, static optimization. And if time permits, we'll talk about dynamic optimization as well. But otherwise, in the next two classes, we are going to talk about optimization. And then we'll talk about adaptive control, just for a little bit. Just one class will focus on adaptive control, because that's also an important topic. Uh, so far, there is no uncertainty in the optimization problems that we are trying to solve. Everything is deterministic. Uh, C is known as the cost function. G is inequality constraint. H is equality constraint. And same thing here. Ct is the cost function. Uh, this summation is over T. T equals 1 to capital T. Gt is the inequality constraint. Ht is the equality constraint. Okay, 
So when we talk about uh, static optimization problem, uh, one of the important things to learn is uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So we'll talk about that first, and then we'll talk about gradient descent algorithm. Uh, one thing to note is in this, like I had mentioned in the beginning of this semester, that we are not proving any results in this class. So whatever results I'm going to write, you just have to, the proof is by authority, which is my authority in this class. Uh, but if you are interested in the, uh, in the proof of the results that I'm going to be talking about, please refer to the uh, EC5500 class. Uh, uh, the, the text there is nonlinear non-linear programming, which is this book. So I'm going to be talking about results from this book. So uh, unfortunately, this class is a collection of topics from various subjects. So uh, there is no text as such. So nothing that introduces all of it in one textbook. So you'll have to collect a lot of different resources in order to learn the proofs of the results that we'll be talking about in the class. Okay, so let's talk about unconstrained static optimization. So the necessary condition So if u star is an optimal solution it's a local minimum let me call it local minimum then gradient of c at u star is equal to 0 and second derivative at u star is positive definite, positive semi-definite. Okay, so what does this say? If u star is a local minimum, so local minimum means that if you stand at a point in the vicinity of that point, that uh, function is minimized at that particular point. So here there are two local minimum. One is this one, let's call it u1 star. And another one is this one, let's call it u2 star. So I have two local minimum here u1 star and u2 star. And what do you notice? What is peculiar about u1 and u2 star? Well, the peculiar thing is if you look at the slope of the function, so remember this is cu, okay? So this function is cu. If you look at the slope of the function at u1 star and u2 star, the slope is zero, okay? Because the tangent to this function is a, is a horizontal line at u1 star and u2 star. So that's the first condition. The second condition is if you look at the curvature of the function. So remember curvature, which is like this, has a positive curvature because the slope is increasing. The slope is negative here. The slope becomes zero and now the slope is positive here. Same thing happens here as well. The slope is negative. So if you look at the tangent, the tangent has a negative value. Then the tangent becomes uh, zero and then the tangent increases to a positive value. So this one says that the curvature is non-negative, okay? So the slope is zero, the curvature is non-negative. 
So how do you, what do you mean, what do you mean by curvature is non-negative? Well, if you look at the second derivative of the cost function at u star, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay? But for this to happen, we need to make sure that u star is a local minimum. So if u star is a local minimum, then these conditions are satisfied. If u star is not a local minimum, uh, well, uh, so these conditions can also be satisfied by non-local minimum points as well. But local minimum will surely satisfy these two conditions. However, if these two conditions are satisfied, it doesn't really imply anything about the u star being a local minimum. So the converse doesn't hold. Um, so in order to study the converse, we need to talk about sufficient condition, which I'm going to write here on this side. So if u bar satisfies so by greater than zero what I mean is positive definite then u bar is a local minima. Okay, so this is known as necessary condition, that is known as a sufficient condition. <coughs> So in order to certify whether a point is indeed a local minimum or not, we need to prove that the first derivative vanishes and the second derivative is actually a positive definite matrix. Then we know for sure it's a local minimum. But if the second derivative is just positive semi-definite, we can't really say anything about whether it's a local minimum or not. Okay, so let me give you an example where this condition is not satisfied. So we have this function and let us consider a point here u3 What's the slope at that particular point? What's the slope of the function at that point? Zero, right? Because the tangent is horizontal. Um, what about the second derivative? The second derivative is also zero because if you look at the function, the function is flat. So the function actually, uh, if you look at it, the slope is zero, 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 and the slope remains zero. Right, So the slope always remains zero throughout and then the slope again starts decreasing. So the second derivative is also zero here. So the first derivative is zero, second derivative is zero. So these two conditions are being satisfied. Both the first order necessary condition and second order necessary condition is satisfied. But u3 star, u3 is not a local minimum. Okay, this is not a local minimum. If you look at it, it doesn't satisfy this positive definiteness condition because the second derivative is zero, it's not positive definite. And so this one, sufficient condition, always allows you to uh, 
to ascertain whether a point is a local minimum or not. So in this case, it's not a local minimum because it doesn't satisfy the sufficient condition. Typically, if I, had, if I draw a Venn diagram, oh, by the way, any questions so far? I want to pause for question before I proceed further. Questions? So we want to, the way, the reason why this topic is important uh, and we use it is whenever we are under an attack or even we, when we are not under, under an attack, we would like to optimize our actions in order to satisfy certain, uh, in order to minimize certain metrics. So typically the cost function is the metric. It could be fuel consumption. It could be uh, tracking error. So we want to minimize the cost function and typically we design our action on the basis of the cost function. So that's why we are studying this topic. And, uh, and so uh, the sufficient condition and necessary conditions are here. Any, if there are no questions, I'm going to erase this part. No? OK. Well, let me erase this side. So if you think of it from a set theoretic perspective, these are the set of all points. So this would be my Rn. This would be the set of points that satisfy the necessary condition. These are the points that are actually optimal. And these are the points that would satisfy the sufficient condition. So typically, you can have points that satisfy necessary conditions but are not optimal. You can have points that are optimal but does not satisfy a sufficient condition and definitely you will sometimes have points that satisfy sufficient conditions as well. Okay, so always keep this Venn diagram in mind just because a point Satisfies necessary condition doesn't mean it's optimal. If a point is optimal, doesn't mean it would satisfy sufficient condition. Okay, one example where a point doesn't satisfy sufficient condition but it still is in optimal is as follows. So this is my cost function. I look at a point here, u star. It doesn't satisfy the sufficient condition because the function is flat in the bottom. As a result of which, the second derivative is equal to 0. So that point doesn't satisfy sufficient condition, but is still optimal. It's local minimum. In this case, actually global minimum. Okay, so how do we uh, how do we come up with algorithm that solves this problem that tries to identify a point that probably uh, satisfies either the ideally you want it to satisfy sufficient condition, but sometimes it might uh, only satisfy necessary condition and you really can't do much about it, but at least it allows you to get some candidate solutions for the optimization problem. So the algorithm's name is gradient descent algorithm. And basically you start with u0 arbitrarily. And then you run the iteration, uk plus 1 equals to uk minus alpha k dk gradient of c evaluated at uk. And dk has to be a positive definite matrix.
and alpha k is a small positive number. And the reason why I write alpha k and dk is because you can actually change these matrices. As long as dk is positive definite and alpha k is small, you can actually change these, uh, these values over time. Okay? And this thing is known as gradient descent. So you start with an arbitrary initial condition. You compute the gradient of C at the point. You multiply it by this positive definite matrix and a scaling term. Subtract it from UK. You get UK plus 1, and then you do it all over again. I'm not going to ask you to uh, code gradient descent in this class. Uh, usually in MATLAB and many other programming uh, languages, uh, you would have some inbuilt functions to run gradient descent algorithms. So all you have to do is pass on the function C, and it will compute the optimal solution. After running the gradient descent algorithm, it will compute the solution and send you the results. Um, depending on the complexity of the function C, uh, running this iteration might take a few minutes, it can take a few seconds, or it can take several months. Um, if you think about uh, large language models, they're also trained using the same algorithm. And running one iteration of, for training of large language models takes of the order of 15 days to 30 days. Okay, so just one iteration. So going from k to k plus 1, in that case, takes uh, 15 to 30 days. But of course, we are not, this is not a class on large language models, but it's just a good thing to know. Uh, any question on gradient descent? No? Have any of you used gradient descent before in any class? Okay. Some of you have. So in this particular course, uh, we'll assume that you know packages that can run gradient descent algorithm internally and can give you the final solution, final output U star after running this for certain number of iterations. Typically, the stopping criterion for gradient descent is when the successive iterates are not too big. So you, you look at UK plus 1 minus UK, you took look at a norm. If the norm is below a certain threshold, the threshold could be 10 raised to minus 5, the threshold could be 10 raised to minus 10. You can decide what that threshold is, and uh, the algorithm terminates and gives you the final iterate UK as the solution to the optimization problem. Okay, so that's all we have for unconstrained problem. So how, what, what are the important things to know for the unconstrained problem? Um, you can have points that satisfy necessary conditions but are not optimal. You can have points that satisfy optimal, like points that are local minimum or points that are global minimum, but they do not satisfy the, uh, they do not satisfy the sufficient conditions. And then you can have points that satisfy sufficient conditions, and then you know for sure that they are optimal. Then the other thing we learned is that there is this gradient descent algorithm. It's a family of algorithm because you can pick dk. Uh, as long as it's positive definite, you have a lot of uh, choices of dk that you can make. As a result of which, you d get different, different algorithms. But so gradient descent is actually a family of algorithms. But nonetheless, there is a family of algorithms that allows you to solve this unconstrained optimization problems. One thing we did not talk about is, what happens if the function f is convex, or sorry, not the function f, but the function c is convex. So if c is convex, so assume that c is a convex function, then u star is global minimum if and only if gradient of c at u star is equal to 0. 
So we are taking the gradient of C with respect to U and I'm evaluating it at U star and that will always be zero uh, at the global minimum. The other cool thing is if you run the gradient descent algorithm and C is convex, you will always converge to the optimal solution. Okay. Any questions so far? When is UK plus one equals to UK? When will these two terms be equal? So this is positive, this is positive definite. When the gradient is zero, right? So whenever you run gradient descent algorithm and UK plus one and UK are very close to each other, it means that the gradient of C is vanishing at UK. And if C is convex, then you know that it's the global minimum. Because if gradient of C at U is zero, then it is a global minimum. This is an if and only if condition. So if U star is a global minimum, then the gradient vanishes. If the gradient vanishes, then, the, then U star is a global minimum. So that's the great thing about gradient descent. So you have an algorithm which allows you to compute the optimal action for the specific problem that you might be solving. Any questions so far? Okay. Perfect. So this is, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to give you any assignment to solve a problem with gradient descent, but I highly encourage you to look up MATLAB packages or whatever is your favorite programming language. Uh, I have stopped using MATLAB like five, six years ago and I've moved on to Python. So, but, but if you're using Python or if you're using PyTorch or if you're using TensorFlow or if you're using uh, uh, MATLAB or Mathematica, it doesn't matter. I'm sure there will be one package that allows you to optimize function so you can give an input as a function and you can try to see how exactly it's computing the gradient descent and uh, giving you the output of what the optimal solution looks like. Uh, there are a bunch of algorithms. I mean, there are, if you look at the, uh, the documentation of these optimization solvers, you will find lots and lots of methods there. Um, you know, of course, we are not going to talk about those methods, but uh, you can pick whatever method seems reasonable, and then you can run the optimization solver according to that particular method. Okay. So let's talk about uh, constraint optimization now. So remember, in the unconstrained optimization, you could take any value in Rn. However, if you think about a hybrid vehicle, can we have uh, can we have current more than the capacity of the battery? Not really. We cannot really input the current. We cannot really extract the current beyond what the capacity, what the battery is rated for. Um, in the case of uh, engines, you cannot really extract more torque than what is feasible from that particular engine. So in many of these situations, you run into optimization problems where there are constraints. So the constraints could be because it's impossible to do it, because it's safe to do it, because it's, uh, or it may not be safe to, to, to use that particular value. Um, what else, where else do constraints appear? Sometimes constraints appear because of the physical coupling. Um, so if you are using a gearbox and you have a certain RPM in the input, then you will have certain RPM at the output. So you can't really have more RPM than what the gear ratio is for. So there are those couplings, uh, physical couplings, chemical couplings, physical constraints, uh, uh, some other form of constraints. Uh, all of these things, uh, or safety constraints, they impose constraints on the set of actions that you can take. And that's studied under constrained optimization. Once again, uh, there are inbuilt solvers 
uh, in many, many, uh, uh, in both Python, MATLAB, Mathematica, and so on to solve constrained optimization problem. So here the problem is, I want to minimize C of u such that g u is less than or equal to zero and h u is equal to zero. Now the question is what is the necessary condition and sufficient conditions for optimality? So once again, I'm going to talk about, uh, I, I don't want to talk about algorithms because there are many, many algorithms again to solve constraint optimization, all of which are built upon gradient descent algorithm. Uh, but let's talk about uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So in order to introduce the necessary condition, I need to talk about set of active constraints So let's denote it by A of U, A at uh, point U equals to I. Uh, actually, let me make a small change. G of R U less than or equal to zero. M is already used P and h of m is already used, h of i u one to q. Okay, so I have p inequality constraints, I have q equality constraints. So the set of active constraints is the set of r such that G of R U equals to zero. Okay, so I am uh, if I have a term, let's say I have two inequalities, u less than or equal to five and minus u less than or equal to zero, which, which is equivalent to saying u is greater than or equal to zero. So I want my u to be between zero and five. Okay, that's my constraint. So I have two constraint. When u equals to five, what is the set of active constraint? Only this one. Okay, this is the only active constraint because u is equal to 5. Actually, I should g1 of u equals u minus 5 less than or equal to 0. g2 of u equals to minus u, which is less than or equal to 0. So I have two constraints here. So when, when I compute, uh, when, I, when u is equal to 5, when this u equals to 5, then A of u is equal to, so let me write it here, A of 5 is equal to just 1, A of 4 is null set, A of 0 is equals to 2. So when u equals to 4, both these constraints are not equal to zero. So G1 is not equal to zero, G2 is not equal to zero. Remember here, we want GR of U equals to zero. So A5 is only one because only the first inequality is active. At four, none of the inequalities are active. At zero, only the second inequality is active. All the other inequalities are inactive. Okay, is this concept clear, set of active constraints? 
So depending on the point U, some constraints may be active, some may be inactive. So we are just collecting the set of active constraints here, okay? And it's only defined for the inequality constraints. For equality constraints, they are always active, right? So remember, HI of U is always equal to zero. So those constraints always have to be active. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Awesome. So the next, yeah. A of minus one. We still have one constraint. Which one? The G, G1 of U will be minus six, which is like less than or equal to zero. Right, but it has to be equal to zero. Only then it is active, otherwise it's inactive. Okay, any other question? Okay, regular point. So this is a definition of regular point. So U bar is a regular point if gradient of H1 at U bar, gradient of HQ at U bar, gradient of gr of u bar for r and the set of active constraints of u bar are linearly independent vectors. Okay, so we have, a, what is the definition of a regular point? So U bar is a regular point if you take the derivative of all the equality constraints evaluated at U bar, so I have Q equality constraints, so I pick all of these Q constraints, take the derivative, so I get vector one, vector two, vector three, vector Q, all of them are evaluated at U bar, and then I only take the derivative of the active constraints here. So remember this R belongs to the set of active constraints at U bar. So at four, I don't have to have this term at all because there are no active constraints. If U bar equals to five, then I have only one active constraint and I need to take gradient of G1 at U bar. When um, U bar equals to zero, I have uh, active constraint two. So this will be gradient of G2 at zero, okay? So we take, uh, uh, we take only those, uh, uh, those inequality constraints here that are active and they take the gradient and evaluate it at U bar. So I get a bunch of vectors here, right? Vector one all the way to vector Q and then maybe vector Q plus one, vector Q plus two and so on. I want all of these vectors to be linearly independent vectors. Then U bar is a regular point. Okay, so that's one, so this is definition one. This is definition two, and I need to define definition three, the Lagrangian. C of U 
plus summation lambda i h i of u i equals 1 to q This is known as a Lagrangian. It's called Lagrangian. So here lambda is in R Q and mu is in R P. And of course, oh, I've written x here, but this should be actually u because we are optimizing over u. So u is in R M. So Lagrangian is defined over three vectors, u, lambda, lambda is in RQ, and mu, which is in RP. So what's the necessary condition? Actually, this is called KKT condition. U star local minimum and is a regular point then. So if U star is a local minimum and is a regular point, then the following conditions hold. Then there exists lambda star mu star such that the derivative of the Lagrangian goes to zero. mu r star is greater than or equal to 0 for all r. Mu r star is equal to 0 for all r in, not in a u star. And then the fourth one is that for all d in v u star, I'm going to define this set v u star shortly. So for all d in v u star, d transpose second derivative of the Lagrangian
is this and uh, maybe I'll write it here. D in R M such that Sorry, it's a whole bunch of equations, but I need to write it. Okay, uh, perfect. So uh, here is the idea here. Uh, if u star is a local minimum and is a regular point, so what is a regular point? All of these vectors are linearly independent. Then there exists Lagrange multipliers. So these are known as Lagrange multipliers. So there exists Lagrange multipliers such that the first derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to u is equal to 0. But where am I evaluating this first derivative? I'm evaluating it at this local minimum and this lambda star which is the Lagrange multiplier and mu star which is also the Lagrange multiplier. So the first derivative of the Lagrangian is 0. The uh, Lagrangian corresponding to the inequality constraints. So remember this mu r is multiplied to gr. So the Lagrangian multiplied corresponding to the inequality constraints are non-negative. The Lagrangian corresponding to inactive inequality constraints are equal to zero. So these are, these are constraints that are inactive. Remember this is the set of active constraints. So R is not in the set of active constraints which means R is inactive. In other words, gr of u star is strictly less than 0. Let me write it here. gr of u star is strictly less than 0. Then it's an inactive constraint. So r is not in the set of active constraints. And the corresponding Lagrange multiplier is equal to 0. And for all d, this is known as the uh, space of first order variations. So for all d, which is uh, uh, potential first order variation, uh, d transpose the second derivative of Lagrangian d is greater than or equal to 0. Oh, this is known as a set of first order feasible directions. So this is first order feasible direction set and, uh, and that satisfies this particular condition. So this is the second order necessary condition. These are all the first order necessary conditions for optimality. The reason why this KKT condition is important is if you look at the algorithms that attempts to solve these constrained optimization problem, heavily relies on these results to get to the optimal point. Okay, so in MATLAB there is a very uh, useful function called f min con. 
So minimize the function f under constraint, so f min con. Uh, so this is, this is in MATLAB, I'm sure there are corresponding uh, solvers in other uh, languages as well. But uh, f min con is typically invoked. So to f min con, you provide the cost function c, you provide the equality constraint function h, you provide the inequality constraint function g, and then you provide a feasible first point, u0. And then it computes the optimal solution. Hopefully that satisfies these conditions, okay? So whenever f min con will output a u star, it will also output lambda star and mu star, okay? So it will not just compute u star, these things are also computed because this is a byproduct of applying the algorithm. So you get u star, you get lambda star, you get mu star, where mu star will satisfy these two conditions. Okay, lambda star will, can be anything. Remember lambda is an RQ, so lambda could be anything. It doesn't have to be non-negative. It could be negative or it could be positive. Okay, and uh, uh, basically MATLAB or fmincon is trying to compute a solution that satisfies these three, con these three conditions. And then it will output that vector u star, lambda star, and mu star. Uh, typically speaking, uh, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, people tend to discard lambda star and mu star. They are not interested in it. But in my research, I'm always interested in lambda star and mu star, so I don't discard it. Uh, depending on your application, you may need it, you may discard it, but uh, generally speaking, uh, when people apply fmincon, they are more interested in u star and they are not interested in this. So it's a byproduct of the optimization solver. Uh, people tend to discard them, but uh, sometimes there is merit in not discarding them. Uh, why you should not discard them? You will learn in 5500, not in this class. So take 5500 next time when it's offered. Any questions so far? I mean, not so far, I think the class has ended. So um, this is all that I wanted to cover today. Uh, yeah, so we learned how to solve unconstrained optimization problem using gradient descent methods. We learned how to, well, we didn't learn how to solve a constrained optimization, but we learned about the theory of constrained optimization and the KKT condition, and the fact that you have Lagrange multipliers here. So we learned about it. Um, if you want to you solve a constraint optimization problem, feel free to use fmincon in MATLAB or any other solver that you are familiar with. Um, and then in the next class, we'll talk about dynamic programming. So dynamic programming is the next important topic, which builds upon this uh, KKT condition stuff that we'll talk about uh, in the next class on Friday. So that's all, thank you so much. See you on Friday.